Hey people, that's Makeda Valletta here. I don't know if any of you, I don't think anybody's really on yet, but in this video, um, I'm going to talk to you about metabolism. Because working in the, in the fitness industry, um, I see there's a lot of um, myths. There's a lot of myths about metabolism, right? Um, so for example, when it comes to weight loss, right? In the fitness industry, amongst um, fitness professionals and sports scientists, exercise physiologists, um, we never use the term losing weight, right? Instead, we wanna talk about losing body fat because muscle is the metabolic tissue of our body. So the more muscle we have, the more, the faster um, our body processes material, calories, food, and stuff like that, right? So the more muscle you have, the faster your metabolism is. And so also, muscle is the metabolic tissue of the body. Muscle is what moves bones. Like my bicep contracts, my bicep connects to my shoulder and my um, elbow, and it contracts and shortens to lift up my arm, my forearm. So muscles move bones, and muscles are also shock absorbers. So um, they take stress off of our joints. This is extremely important, especially as we age. When you see elderly people who um, maybe they have a hard time like lifting their arm or sitting down becomes a problem or their knees start hurting, you know, it's because after the age of 30, we lose about 2% of our muscle mass every year. Now, how much muscle we, we lose after 30 depends on what you did before 30 and what you continue to do after 30. So if you were engaging in like strenuous activities before, you know, growing up before the age of 30, that builds a good foundation. Then from that point, if you continue to do anabolic muscle building activity, because we can do exercise that's catabolic, which means it breaks down muscle, or we can do stuff that's anabolic, which means it builds muscle, right? So as long as we engage in anabolic activity, as we age, we can maintain our muscle mass, which means we maintain our function, which means we maintain our metabolism, which means that our bones and our joints don't start hurting. Like, oh, my back hurts, oh, my knees hurt, because you're losing the muscle around that area. Whenever you have problems with your joints, you need to strengthen the muscles around that joint, okay, to help support that joint. So because of this, right, we want to understand that muscle is more dense than fat. So when you're doing weight loss and you're saying, I want to lose 10 pounds, the dangerous thing about that is you can lose 10 pounds, but it may not be 10 pounds of fat. You could lose 10 pounds, then you might lose 10 pounds of muscle. You might lose 7 pounds of muscle and 3 pounds of fat. You might lose 2 pounds of water, you know, uh, 1 pound of fat, and 7 pounds of muscle. So losing 10 pounds does not mean that you, all of that was fat. So in a so-called weight loss program, you always want to be um, focused on losing fat. So I don't even like saying weight loss. I like saying fat loss, right? Lose fat. Because if you have a healthy body fat percentage, like I have a healthy body fat percentage. If I lose 10 pounds, I'm losing a lot of muscle. That's not a healthy thing. So if you have a, a healthy body fat percentage, you don't want to lose weight and start losing your muscle. That's never good. But... If you have too much body fat and you lose weight, you want to lose fat. You don't want to lose muscle and you don't, you know, want to severely dehydrate yourself and stuff like that. Now, the thing about weight, really, it's not really about your overall weight. It's about your composition. How much of your body weight is fat? How much of it is muscle? So, in the fitness world, well, to elite fitness professionals, people who really know what they're doing, who are not fly-by-night scam artists, which a lot of people are in the fitness industry, a lot of people in the fitness industry are not qualified the way they should be to be giving advice to people. Now, to sports scientists and exercise physiologists, we do not use the BMI, which is the body mass index. Instead, we use body fat percentage, okay? Because the body mass index only takes into account height and weight. It does not take into account how much of that weight is fat, how much of it is muscle. That is the critical component and what really matters. Um, because you could have two men who are 200 pounds. One dude could be 200 pounds and um, he is 4% body fat. 
Another dude could be 200 pounds and he's 45% body fat. That means that, that that man who is 45% body fat is like morbidly obese, morbidly obese. Okay, um, you could have two women who are 160. One woman who's 160, she could be 20% body fat, which is like, to, I'm about 22% to, body fat. That's what 22% body fat looks like on a woman. Um, elite female sprinters tend to be between 18 and like 21% body fat. If I, you have two women who are 160, one of them is 20% body fat, the other one is 35% body fat. The one who's 35% body fat is in like the obese category. It's not the weight, it's the percent of fat that you have on your body. So when you're you know, doing a so-called weight loss program, you need to be monitoring your body fat percentage, not your overall weight so much. The, the, where weight can come into play is when you're using it in combination with body fat percentage, right? So let's say you're in a weight loss program and you're using your weight and your body fat percentage. The body fat percentage is the most important measurement. Now, from that's, that's what matters the most. Now, from that point, let's say you are doing your weight and your body fat percentage. Let's say your body fat percentage has only changed 1%, only going down 1%. But then you get on a scale and you lost 20 pounds. That means you lost a whole lot of muscle. You know, you lost a whole lot of muscle. So in a fat loss program, you only want to use the weight component in combination with the body fat percentage to be sure that you're not losing muscle. But really, it's the if you work out correctly and you engage in anabolic activities and you eat properly, not like you know a giraffe, then you should not lose muscle. Okay, losing muscle happens when you engage in catabolic exercise, like jogging too much, like jogging for miles. That causes you to, to burn muscle, right? It causes you, you burn fat, but you burn muscle too. Whereas if you sprint you um, burn fat and you gain muscle. And remember, the muscle is a metabolic tissue of the body. So, um, and, and one thing I see a lot with, in fitness, with women especially, a lot of women and female athletes, they think, oh, okay, so I just did this really intense workout. And in their mind, they're like, oh, I burned 500 calories or whatever. And then they feel like, well, I can't eat this 700 calorie whatever food because they're thinking that, oh, I'm just gonna put back all the calories I just lost and I'm not going to lose weight. That is not how metabolism works. Like, whoever was the person to tell everybody that weight loss equals, you know, calories in equals calories out, that is a total myth. That is a total myth. First of all, how, met how calories are metabolized depends on the composition of the person to begin with, how much muscle and fat does this person have to begin with, number one. Number two, it has to do with the timing of the meal. Like if you are have a lot of body fat, if you're, if you're overweight, you know, over fat, you have a lot of body fat, and you're sitting around drinking juice all the time, that juice is going to contribute to making you more fat. But if you're somebody who is, you know, working out all the time, you just did an extreme, an intense workout for an hour, you were like doing some really strenuous work, and it's hot outside, and you sit and drink juice, your muscles are going to immediately pick up that, um, your muscles are, are immediately going to utilize that sugar. And it's going to use it to store it into your muscles as muscle glycogen. And that's important because you're going to need muscle glycogen to go hard again tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. Okay? Um, also, if you're consuming fat from like soybean oil or canola oil, that is metabolized totally different than consuming fat, the MCT, um, fats and CLAs and MCTs from coconut oil or from grass-fed beef and butter. Those fats are metabolized completely different than rancid vegetable oil, omega-6 polyunsaturated fats. When you know you have a um, when you have a fat or a food that is um, what is it um, refined it is metabolized differently than a food that is not refined. So metabolism is not just about calories and equals calories out. It's a lot of things that play a role into metabolism. And so in the general fitness world, people want to talk about losing weight, you know, they want to talk about these calories and calories in equals calories out. Those are all myths. And I'm telling you this as a sports scientist, as an exercise physiologist, as a sports nutritionist, you know, um, and that's the problem with this field is that the scientists know this, you know. But the practitioners a lot of times are, don't read the science. They don't read research, you know, um, they get these fly-by-night certifications and they spread a lot of myths, you know. 
And some people can spread those myths and those people might look good because some people just have the genetics. Like some people eat McDonald's all the time and they look good, right? Just because somebody looks good doesn't always mean they know what they're talking about. And that's the problem with the fitness industry is that people are so focused on looks that a lot of the content is not um, the truth. You know, you're being told incorrect things and you believe it because this person looks good. No, not at all. So, um, oh, I took my glasses off so I couldn't see. Oh, okay. Thank you for the compliments. I hope that you all found this video helpful. It's just a quick video on metabolism. Um, I do, this is why when I work with individual clients, I evaluate people thoroughly. I really take a deep look at what it is they're doing, what they're eating before I give advice. Um, and technically, trainers are not qualified to give nutrition advice, um, but most do because people ask trainers for nutrition advice. I have a background in nutrition, so I am qualified. I am a sports nutritionist, so I'm qualified to give this advice. Um, but most aren't, so just be careful with listening to trainers when it comes to that. And so um, I'm always available for distance consultations and training sessions and, um, and in person in New York and Chicago or wherever else I tend to go. So if you are interested in speaking with me about evaluations or working with me in person or from a distance, feel free to email me directly at thebodyscientist81 at gmail.com. And follow me on YouTube. Check my other videos, The Body Scientist 81 okay? I hope um, you all found this video helpful and have a great day. Bye, people.